of our Lord, 2022. I'm Pastor Ron. I'll be bringing the message today, and we will be in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as we continue and are almost done with our search through the first epistle of Paul to the church in Thessalonica. Lord God, I ask you to be with us this morning as we search your word, as we, uh, as we learn many things, God. We ask you to give us really teachable hearts and humble spirits today. And God, for those of our church family who are traveling today, we ask you to give them protection and safety on their tra travels. And those who are homesick and watching on the internet, Lord, I uh, pray that, they, that you would be just as real together with them there as you are with us even here this morning, Lord. Lord, open our minds and our hearts to your truth. And again, I say, uh, give us a spirit of humility and a teachable heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, uh, I want to an announce again, uh, because it's been a while, that uh, women's ministry will be starting again today, right after the church service. Yay is right. And uh, we hope to follow up with men's ministry in the coming weeks after that. We'll let you know more about that. But uh, all women are invited to that. You'll be in the social hall back here. There'll be, I see some finger foods in the refrigerator. I'm sure it's going to be a good time. I would, as, uh, as one of the guys here who's going to be looking for something to do while you women are meeting, I'd invite any guys who want to come out to lunch with me over at Firehouse Subs, come over and join us over there. I see some thumbs up. And uh, we'll just be hanging out and eating sub sandwiches and salads and having a good time. So um, if you would rise this morning, we're going to be uh, reading our text from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And our text today is in verses 19 through 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 19 through 22. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Lord God, we thank you for this uh, very brief passage within your word that is just power packed and full of wisdom and goodness for us full of spiritual nutrition for us today, and we ask you, God, to feed us. Feed us from your, your word, even as we are here uh, beginning to wrap up First Thessalonians. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks. Please have a seat. I may uh, drink a little hot water or cough from time to time. Sorry about that. Still recovering from something. <coughs> so... We have an unusual title for the message today. I was going to call it Test All Things, but thought that uh, to title it differently, How to React When Your Pastor Kills Your Cow. <laughs> How to React When Your Pastor Kills Your Cow. I'm not trying to be cute with that. It's um, bringing in a cultural reference to something. Perhaps you've heard of the phenomenon in the country of India called the sacred cow. The sacred cow, they, they believe in the Hindu religion that animals must be protected, and that includes cows. And cows especially are revered by their religion uh, as being worthy of protection and worthy of um, even sort of a quasi kind of worship, but not, they're not really worshiping the cow is my understanding. But what you will see is you will see if you walk the streets of India, I am told and I have seen on the internet and newspapers and other places, just cows wandering. And, uh, and some of them have halters on them and others are just loose. Just some of them are tied up. Others are wandering around. Some of them you'll see that people are actually feeding the cow. They're bringing food to the cow as an act of worship or an act of their religious practice. And others are just wandering around, loose, and uh, to some extent creating havoc. 
it's a big problem in the, I believe, in my opinion, in the, in the areas of the world that have this belief that uh, they also cannot destroy rats and mice. And so when the Hindu people are storing grain, which they live off, uh, especially off rice, they are not allowed to kill rats and mice who then also get into and contaminate and, and, and waste in and, and uh, destroy their grain stores. There are actually patrols of people who families you know, need to stay up all night and have somebody on patrol in the family field and garden to uh, watch for these sacred cows wandering around and who are on the search at night for fruits and vegetables and things that the family should eat from their own garden. And so you'll take turns being on guard at night and then you see a cow wander into your field. You chase it out, but you can't hit it. You can't be cruel to it. You can't touch the cow. You can physically touch it, but you may not molest the cow. And so this has become a proverb and a byword in our language, which is the, the phrase sacred cow. It doesn't just mean a cow in India that can't be harmed, but it means this. It means an idea or a custom or institution which is held, especially sometimes unreasonably, to be above or immune to criticism or opposition. I'll repeat that. An idea or a custom or belief or institution which is held, especially sometimes unreasonably, to be above or immune to criticism or opposition. So the title maybe makes a little more sense now when I say how to react when your pastor kills your cow. That's part of the job description of a faithful Bible teacher is to, is to dismantle beliefs which are ant antithetical to scripture and we may find that we are surprised if we do some self-examination to find that many, perhaps most of us, have some kind of sacred cow, I'm going to put that in air quotes here, some kind of sacred cow or sacred cows that we hold above criticism or immune to opposition or even examination. These can be uh, all manner of things, and this I need to be very careful if I mention a few, because without giving a thorough treatment of those topics, um, somebody here could be offended. And shock of all shocks, uh, uh, then want to run away. That happens, believe it or not. So I'll choose uh, just a few examples uh, of the less, maybe the less, um, hot topics. Unwed parenthood. People have really strong opinions about that. People can get offended if you talk about it from the scriptures. Um, abortion is one. Thou shalt not steal is a commandment of God. And most of us would agree with that. But then what about when the pastor says, that means you shall not cheat on your taxes. You shall pay your taxes. Everything that is due to the government, whether you like the government or not, whether you think that the government is being faithful with your taxes, using them the way that you want to see them used or not, it's still not our money. It belongs to the government. Uh, racism is a hot topic today. Equity, diversity, inclusion. What about hate speech? We hear the phrase hate speech today. That's a way to get tempers flared right away on, on both sides, some, you know, in saying, some are saying, you know, there is no such thing as hate speech. Others are saying there is hate speech, but it's protected. Others are saying that hate speech should be attacked and people do not have the right to say things which I deem to be hateful to my cause or to my, or to my uh, institution. <coughs> the whole field of medical ethics. What about the idea of mate selection, how to choose a husband or a wife? What, what about within marriage, roles of within marriage, uh, the, the, the idea of male and female, separate, different, distinct from each other? Uh, what about the concept of equality? These are things that you may not get to see that, that pastors get ambushed with. 
from time to time. Uh, and usually, uh, we try to be really good-natured about it. And, uh, and I think, you know, hopefully for the most part, we, we are. But uh, a lot, even sometimes people don't realize they're doing it and can be excused for that. And uh, so for example, every once in a while, we'll have a guest come here and they are checking out the church. And they, there's some things that they want to do their due diligence on and they want to know the answer to several questions about doctrine. I encourage that, by the way. I think that's a good thing. And uh, I'm very, very patient with that. But sometimes it's hard to answer quickly, you know. Uh, I've had people come and they have their two or three questions that they really need to see answered before they'll return for another visit, for example. I had uh, a very nice young couple come in one time and on, on the way out the door and they, they were leaving, they thought they would ask a question that they were sure I could just deal with in two or three words. Do you believe once saved, always saved? It, it, may, it, it may sound to you like there's a yes or a no answer to that, and indeed, after a long discussion, there is. Um, but a pastor will want to do his due diligence also and say, what do you mean by saved? What do you mean by once saved? What do you mean by always saved? And then that's immediately can be perceived as you're being evasive, pastor. It's a yes or no question. Just answer yes or no. And the fact is, it's not a yes or no question um, on the surface of it. But eventually, we can get down to that one-word answer, yes. Um, so uh, these, are, these are things that are like sacred cows to us. I'm going to go into these uh, four verses now. Verses, uh, chapter 5 of First Thessalonians, verses 19 through 22. And we are going to uh, deal with each one of these four uh, verses, and then we'll have kind of a synopsis of all, but we're going to really focus on the third one, test all things and hold fast what is good. So we, we look at the context of what is going on here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 starts off, so just for context, it starts off, um, on a very serious note. It's not a joyful, kind of a happy, um, glib sort of a topic. He's talking about the day of the Lord. <laughs> the day of the Lord when the Lord returns and, and there will be judgment at that time. And, and for when they say peace and safety, well then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. This is very heavy stuff. It's very heavy stuff. And then Paul starts to be closing out the chapter, and he starts to, he starts to close out then after this um, those thoughts, and he needs, to, he needs to now encourage people. And so verse, uh, verse 14, chapter 5, verse 14, which we went through last week, was now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. So he gets to the temperament of the minister. Be patient with all. And see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. So he's still giving some cautions, but he's starting to back out of the, the very dark and heavy topics. <coughs> but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Then we saw last week, rejoice always. Rejoice always. So he's, he's bringing it up that this is the, anti this is the antidote for kind of the gloom of the, some of the previous passages. He's saying, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, he, he launches into verse 19, says, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. So we go from several commands which are stated positively, and now we go to a command which is stated negatively. After, after rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Now, do not quench the spirit. In your Bible, you may see a capital S, spirit. And so perhaps your mind goes immediately to the place of do not quench the Holy Spirit of God. Does it really mean that 
person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. Let's, it's not so straightforward as it may seem just because there's a capital S in your text. Can you really quench God Almighty, the master and creator of the universe? The word quench is I extinguish, I quench, I suppress, or I thwart. Can God be thwarted? Can God be suppressed by a mere human being? When we put it, the question in those terms, the answer seems pretty clear. No, the Holy Spirit, the person of God, who is the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete, cannot be extinguished by mere mortals. So what is this talking about? It's talking about the work of the Spirit in your life. The plans of God, the invitation of God can be ignored at our own peril. And, and so the Holy Spirit seeks to work in our life unto our salvation and unto our sanctification and, and then ultimately to our glorification when we go to heaven. <coughs> But we are not capable, we're not that strong enough. We're not strong enough to extinguish the Holy Spirit of God. It's not like candles on a birthday cake where we can just go, oh, there's the, the Holy Spirit at work. Poof. I just blew it out. So, so we're not talking about extinguishing the Holy Spirit of God. That's too strong of an idea. But there are other passages that give a little bit more light to this, which is about when we uh, work in opposition to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Jesus wept. Jesus was grieved. God was, the Father was aggrieved from, from time to time with, with mankind. He even says that he regretted even creating humankind. Remember when everybody did what was right in their own eyes and the Lord bowed to, to himself. He was going to destroy all of humankind, but he saved eight souls. Noah and his family. But do not grieve the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed to the day of redemption. You see, the Holy Spirit seals you to the day of redemption. And this gets to our doctrine of salvation. You are born of a seed which is imperishable. You cannot be snatched from God's hand. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of salvation. So that same Spirit who has sealed you to salvation and that you cannot be snatched out of God's hand, don't grieve that Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit may also be withdrawn by God. Psalm 51, verse 11 says this, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. This was at a time when people were not automatically infilled by the Holy Spirit when they came to faith in God. That the, the Holy Spirit would come upon people, like he would come upon Samson. He would come upon David. And, and they would do mighty acts but there was not that infilling of the Holy Spirit of God at that time. Jesus left us the comforter. And now we who believe in Jesus are, are, are possessed by and infilled with the Holy Spirit of God. But the Holy Spirit, his work among people, it may be withdrawn by God at God's will. The Holy Spirit may also be neglected. The scriptures say, Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery or of the elders. <clears throat> so we can resist the Holy Spirit's work on ourselves, but we cannot extinguish the Holy Spirit like blowing out or drowning a flame. So why this command? Why does he say, Extinguish not the Spirit? Well, I think it follows logically from the, the previous three verses. This is extinguishing the Spirit with the, the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. The previous three verses had said, rejoice always. What that's saying is, what's the opposite of that? Don't be full of gloom. 
don't be for gloom is the enemy of of God's work. That's that sense of hopelessness. What can God accomplish in your life if you have a sense of gloom and doom? Pray without ceasing, said verse 17. The neglect of prayer, of not conversing with God, is going to suppress the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. In that sense, it will quench the Spirit. Quench the Spirit. And then in everything, give, give thanks, verse 18. <clears throat> we talked last week about how Satan is unable to be grateful. There's no gratitude in Satan's heart for nothing. And in fact, there can be no goodness in people without gratitude. Dennis Prager talks a lot about this. He's an Orthodox Jew or a conservative Jew who um, runs this organization called Prager U or Prager University. I recommend his videos. He's very, very, very friendly to the Christian faith. And um, I have not found anything in there so far after listening to hundreds of his videos. Uh, I have not found anything objectionable to the Christian faith in there so far. But he talks, he has a whole long talk that he does about gratitude. Gratitude. Gratitude is necessary for us to have happiness. Gratitude is necessary for us to please God. Ungrateful people cannot please God. Gratitude is necessary for us to have to be used by God. So these three positives which is stated as a negative, if we're, gloom, if we're gloomy, if we neglect prayer, and if we fail to be grateful, we can easily serve to stop the work of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. So quench not the Spirit in your life. That's what I believe quench not the Spirit means in there. As the Ellicott commentary says, Christianity is an enthusiasm or it is nothing. Christianity is an enthusiasm, or it is nothing. Have you ever seen a victorious Christian who is not enthusiastic about his or her faith? It's a good question. And we go to verse 20. Do not despise prophecies. And of course, depending on your church tradition and what you've been taught and what you've believed all your life, you may read this differently than I do. It's okay. We can have agreements or disagreements or discussions about this. Do not despise prophecies. <coughs> the word there is propheteia. It's prophecy or prophesying. It's the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed truth. Revealed truth. Now, there are uh, different uses of that word in Scripture. It is prophecy is, is this exact word is also used for the foretelling of something that has not happened yet. This word is also used for the, uh, for the speaking the praises of God in a way that is especially inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about, and in, even in the New Testament, talks about prophets and prophetesses in that way. There was a man who had several daughters. They were all prophetesses. They would speak in the church setting from time to time the praises of God and what they believed that the Holy Spirit was saying to the church at that time. <coughs> but in this context here, the, the major, my understanding of the context here, is that the major meaning of this do not despise prophecies is just this. Do not despise the preaching and teaching of God's word. There's a, it's, a, it's a central, if not the central ministry in the church of God. It is so important that uh, Paul talked about this extensively in 1 Corinthians. He said, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. <coughs> but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. So w when, we give the, uh, when we give a prophecy, when we're speaking about the, the word of God, when we're reinforcing the truths of scripture, it's not infallible. 
let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. We see here that this business of prophecy is for, that for everybody to learn and for everybody to be encouraged. Now here's, here's the catch to that. When I stand up here and I quote unquote prophesy, when I am, when I am entering into using this gift of prophecy, this gift of teaching and rightly dividing the word of God and presenting it to people. Verse 32, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What you see up here is a fallible human being who's doing the best he can through prayer, meditation, through the searching of the scriptures to rightly divide the word of God, but I can make mistakes up here. So it should never be sacrosanct what I say. Your job is to go home and examine these scriptures and see whether these things that I say are true. Whether these things are true. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So what, we, what the churches ought not to have is confusing, confusion coming from the pulpit. It needs to be united, and we need to guard the pulpit and speak with one voice from the pulpit. From time to time, that may not happen, and we'll correct that if that ever happens. But uh, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So do not despise prophecies, but sort of be on your guard. Is If that balance makes sense there, I hope that it does. And now, verse 21, test all things and hold fast what is good. Test all things. Occasionally up here, uh, you'll, hear, you'll hear my microphone working, and then suddenly, if you're listening online, I just moved my lips and I was uh, acting like I was talking, but I wasn't really saying anything. But the idea is that sometimes the battery goes out on this microphone. There's a microphone pack right there, and the battery will die. And that's because one of us forgot to get a tester, which is this little guy here, and to do a test on it. Or sometimes it's just a bad battery. And uh, we'll go through a bunch of these 9-volt batteries back in the sound room from time to time, and we'll test a bunch of them. And there's a red zone here and a green zone here. And red is uh, needs replacement, and green is good. <coughs> so we'll take a battery and go, oh, that's a replacement. It goes over here. Take another battery. Oh, that's in the green zone. It goes over here. It's good. And we test every battery to see whether it is good. And then we separate the bad from the good, hopefully. And then we hold fast to the good batteries, and we take the, the depleted batteries and there's enough power in them for kids to run toys with them or, or maybe we'll just like box them up and send them to the recycling place. But test all things and hold fast what is good. This word test is to test and by then implication to approve. So we're not just testing, but we're testing and approving. We're testing to see whether something is useful, whether something is accurate. The usage is this, I put things to the test, I prove them, I examine them, I distinguish between the good and the bad through testing, and then I approve of the good and I reject the bad. We're looking for those things which are fit, and those things which are suitable, and those things which are accurate. And it's not just me, it's all of us. We all need to be doing this thing. Test all things and hold fast what is good. Now, very soon after this, we're going to see uh, later in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, already false teachers were arising. And this was, this was being put to the test already in the very next book, 2 Thessalonians. Paul says this, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. You see, there were already pseudepigraphal writings, which is to say fake, fake letters, supposedly from Paul, but not really, where it would be signed Paul. And it would say, hey, you know what? Um, 
The day of Christ has already come. Did you miss it? And so they were trying to cause trouble in the church. It was fake news, as it were. <coughs> so those things need to be tested. Now, how tested? I'm going to go through about 10 or 11 examples of how to test these things. Now, the teachings of God, the, the doctrines, especially in the New Testament, are often called these things. Those two words put together, you can do a search on it in your, on your uh, laptop at home. Just type in, quote mark, these things, end quote, like that. And you'll get a long list of, especially in the New Testament, where it's talking about the teachings, the doctrines of God. So, how do we test these? For one, we test these things not alone, but in community. If something needs to be tested and you're suspicious of a teaching, it's worth asking somebody else about it too. Hey, I heard this. Is that what you heard? And does that sound right? It could be from somebody on the internet. It could be from some big teacher. Um, if it's here in this church, don't go to your neighbor and ask them. Come to me and ask me. And that's, that's the proper order of how to do these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and diversities of ministries, but the same Lord, and diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. So, to one, there is faith by the Spirit, to another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit, and to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, that's one of the things that we were talking about this morning, and to another, the discerning, <coughs> excuse me, to another, discerning of spirits. That's a spiritual gift. See, when we're functioning in the Holy Spirit, there should be people in most congregations who have this God-given, Spirit-given gift that they can discern spirits. That's an amazing gift. A lot of times I wish I had that gift, that I could say, like, wow, I've got that gift. I tend, I tend to sort of rely on my street smarts a lot and think that I'm discerning spirits. Sometimes I am. When you've hitchhiked in a strange country where you don't know the language and you have like three seconds to decide if this guy who stopped for you is going to be a good ride or a bad ride, you learn to discern their spirit pretty quickly. And, and you, you develop sort of a street savvy about things. But there is a special gift, the discerning of spirits. And you might be surprised, as I've been surprised, who will, who will operate in that gift? I've found sometimes that it's a child who will just say, Daddy, that guy gives me the creeps. And they can't articulate it. But later on, you find out, yeah, there's a reason for that. It may be somebody who doesn't ever normally operate in, in, in any kind of public gifts, you know, public proclamations, you know, thus saith the Lord or anything like that, but they're just quiet and maybe a little timid. And you can go over to them and say, what do you think about that? And they'll tell you. And it's stunning how accurate people can be. A lot of, um, a lot of employers have found this out. When they have people come in to interview for jobs, Oftentimes, and I don't know what it is, but oftentimes that person at the reception desk out front, you may not know this, they get like the final say a lot of times. Maybe, maybe that's the wrong way to put it. Their input is sought. So somebody, some hotshot salesman comes in, he's looking for a job, he interviews with the man, you know, in the suit and tie, the power suit behind the desk, and the interview, he goes well and everything, and the man, the boss, is impressed with the candidate, but then goes out to that person behind the reception desk out there and says, did you get to talk to this, this guy? Yeah, I talked to him for about 30 seconds. What'd you think? 
I don't know. Got a, got a bad feeling about that one. And it's right. It's correct. Some people just operate in this way of discerning of spirits. spirits. So when you test all things, you can test things. One way to test things that you're being taught or the people that are teaching you is to do it in community with other people. Rather than think, I am, the, I am the tester of all things. I've got the tester right here. I don't need to consult with anybody. I can determine for myself a good teaching from a bad teaching, a good teacher from a bad teacher. It's okay and it's good to go to somebody else uh, who has this gift of discerning of spirits. Now, another thing to understand is this. The Bible is not the opinion of men, but the actual words of God. And so, <coughs> we're not judging the word. We're judging the teacher. We're not judging the scripture. We're judging what is said about the scripture. In Second Peter, Peter says this, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. See, he's claiming apostolic authority here. He was with Jesus. He saw Jesus. He saw the majesty of Jesus. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, and when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. By the way, Peter was there when that happened. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So this means, this means two things, two things. Number one is, when you read the prophecy of Scripture, these are not the private opinions of individual human beings. These are the words of God being spoken to, inspired, breathed by God through godly men who faithfully write it down for us. <coughs> second thing is, is this. A second meaning of this is this. This um, interpretation of this scripture is not strictly for you to do or for me to do alone, apart from and separate from the community of faith. We don't get to judge for ourselves, a, 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 a have our own private interpretation of this scripture. Well, this scripture may mean that this to you, but to me, it doesn't mean that at all. It means this. And you find that you're swimming upstream. And like the entire church disagrees with you on that. And you have this heterodox opinion, which has not been tested by others. This is how we get, uh, we get false teaching and false doctrine that creeps into the church. And shepherds, pastors, are part of our job is to, is to guard against that. So we, we look for wolves in sheep's clothing who want to teach or promulgate divisive doctrines and things that they have. Wow, look what I found in Scripture, and nobody else has ever seen this, but I just have to speak it forth. And sometimes, uh, here's a kind of a classic example, when somebody talks a lot about the Nephilim. The Nephilim. Who are the Nephilim? It's when angels abandoned their abode, and they had relations with the daughters of men. And, and then the Nephilim, the, there were giants on the earth in that time. And somebody just, that's their hobby horse. They ride that horse like crazy, and they're always talking about, there's giants among us. There's spirit beings, even here. In this, you know, and it gets crazy. They've taken something in Scripture, and they, they seize on it for some reason, and they run with it, and it's like the central thing that they're talking about all the time. This scripture is not for us to find a hobby horse and to ride hard. 
<coughs> we do the interpretation of Scripture in a community of faith. This is how we develop doctrine. Doctrine is not something for one man to write down. If I, if I study the Scripture and I come up with, you know what, my doctrine of salvation is this. I'm going to write it down, and I'm going to teach it. I don't have that right. The Ron doctrine of salvation, Ronian salvation doctrine, no, it doesn't work that way. We, we develop doctrine in community. Hope that makes sense to you. Here's a, an, another, another way to test these things. Only believe the spirits that confess a true faith in Jesus Christ. Who, do, who shall we listen to? The first people we should listen to are those who initially confess a true faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, in 1 John chapter 4, John says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. <coughs> now, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. What's your news source? Do you have a source of news for secular news, for worldwide news, for national news, which is fundamentally hostile to the Christian faith? If you do, you need a different source of news. There are sources of news which are, they may not be overtly Christian, but they are not hostile to the Christian faith. They don't have an ax to grind. They, they may try to steer a neutral course, and they are doing the best they can. They, they are, they are uh, not attacking the Christian faith. They're not attacking Western civilization, which is based on Scripture. So, do not believe and do not trust every spirit that does not confess a true faith in, in, Jesus, in Jesus Christ. Your reporters, your news agencies, they may or may not be overtly Christian. They may be overtly evangelical or not, but they should at the very least not be hostile to the faith. I get, uh, I'm amazed sometimes when I talk with people and they say, did you see on CNN? <laughs> no. Why would I ever tune into CNN, which is avowedly and overtly hostile to all things Christian? No, I didn't see it on CNN. Now, sometimes I tune in just because I want to see what the enemy is doing. How else may we test these spirits. It must agree with the teaching of the apostles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. <coughs> hold fast to the word, to the word. We saw the illustration of the batteries. A next um, method of testing things is a, little, is a little more vague, but try to stay with me on this. Do not abandon your common sense. Your common sense. So not all things must be proven by a direct quotation of Scripture. This is the final word. This is the final arbiter of truth. It gives us direction for, for believing and living correctly. This is what guides us. But there will be many questions in life that you will not find a scripture which addresses your question or your problem directly. Use your common sense. What is your common sense based on? It should be based on in 
inculcating these principles into your life so much that you live and breathe the Psalms and the, the Proverbs, the words of Jesus. And they become a part of you. So that when you're tested by something, it's like you know the mind of Christ already. That's scriptural, that we can know the mind of God. Not that we can comprehend or grasp, but that we can operate in a way that pleases God. Do not abandon your common sense. Many things, perhaps most things, need to be tested by broad-based principles which can be found in the body, or in the, in the corpus of the Bible, but which cannot be found in a specific verse that addresses your specific question or problem. <clears throat> so how do we do this? Well, sit down and do a scripture search. We're going to start a course in a couple of weeks called uh, How to Study the Bible. But do your own scripture search about the, the principles of the problem that you're attempting to solve. And then, if you're still stuck, go and ask your pastor. Hey, pastor, what does the Bible say about this? And, we can, and then it helps if you take me out to lunch. Because then we have time to talk about it. And, um, and we can have a good discussion back and forth. Next, do not submit to the temptation to phrase your questions to yourself. Well, especially, to, let's say to your pastor. You, you go to your pastor. It's, I'm a reference point for you. I'm a uh, a resource. It, it helps not to phrase your questions as a gotcha question. As a gotcha question. Because not all things are easily answered in one, with one word. As we saw with some of the previous examples. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into a little deeper into one of these. Uh, I, get, I get asked this from time to time, and I will refer back to that couple that was in the back of the church and they were leaving, and, and they just needed to have this question answered. Do you believe once saved, always saved? And I thought about that, you know, is there a quick answer? Can I come up with a quick answer? So I went to Paul in the scripture, and I'm like asking, so Paul, do you have, a, do you have like a two-sentence answer for me on that? And here's what I found. There, there are folks that, that, uh, that, that put this question this way. Do you believe that all that is necessary to be saved is that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you will be saved? That's a direct quote of Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And to that we can say, of course, it's Scripture. But... Why didn't Paul stop with that verse? He didn't intend for there to be a one-phrase answer to the question of salvation. So this is, this is Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's true. Pastor, do you believe it? Yes or no? Well, let's see, you and I have no history. You haven't listened to my teaching before. What do you mean by saved? What do you mean by believe? What do you mean by heart? What do you mean by God has raised him from the dead? I want to have a discussion about that. No, 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 yes or no. I want a yes or no answer. Well, then why couldn't Paul give a yes or no answer? Paul needed 16 chapters, 433 verses, 9,422 words to answer the question about the doctrine of salvation, which is mostly what the whole book of Romans is about. So what I'm encouraging us all to do is, in our searching of Scripture, let's don't focus on, on catchy catchphrases or fragments of a verse, like one half of one verse in a book of over 9,000 words. Take the time to study it. And it, I promise you, if you come to me and there's just something that's really bugging you about something in Scripture, 
I'll spend the time with you. We can spend hours. I'm available. We can do this. But it's not profitable to you or to me or to anybody to insist on an answer like that with many of these things. So, how do you react when your pastor kills your cow? We'll come back to that question. You have a sacred cow. Maybe you're already bridling at the fact that I said you have a sacred cow. Okay, that's your sacred cow. I think we all have a sacred cow, probably, somewhere. Some belief that we cling to because that's the way we were brought up, or it always seemed right to us, or because I have so much emotional investment in the outcome of this question that if I ask this question and you don't answer in a way that affirms my belief, I'm going to be deeply, deeply, deeply wounded and I'll just want to go away. And that's a common, common thing in the church. How do you react when your pastor kills your cow? First off, go talk to him. Ask him. Hey, I think I just heard you say such and such. Is that what you said? And if it is, is that what you meant? What did you mean by that? And if, if you come with that kind of, here's, in my experience, when I've gone to pastors about this before, because remember, I'm a new pastor. Uh, if you come with that attitude of, hey, what did you mean by that? I was confused because I've always heard it this way. Is, that, am I, is my understanding correct? You'll probably get an immediate answer or very close to an immediate answer. But if you call late at night all upset and your voice is quivering and you're just like, I'm so upset about this. I, I feel like I have to leave the church. I've got to leave. I've got to leave. I go, what, leave? <laughs> Why? Well, because you said such and such. Okay, can we talk about it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm so upset. So you're not going to get an answer immediately at that point. What's the wise thing for the pastor to do? To respond this way. Let's talk about this when you've calmed down. That's a legitimate response. Let's don't talk about this now, late at night, where you want a two-word answer. Well, when do you want to talk about it? Well, given your current state of mind, I'd say let's talk in about a month. I'm not being cute when I say that. It may take a person that long to settle down. I've seen it. Let's talk about it in a month. Okay, but I'm not going to come to church for that entire month. No, that's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude. Keep coming. Keep practicing community with the fellowship of believers. Keep discerning the scriptures together in community. And when you've calmed down and you've realized, yes, this is the same pastor who has invested four, five, six, seven, eight years in my life faithfully, I'm not going to just throw that away. After four weeks, you'll be settled down and we can talk about it. You've done this as parents with children. You've done this as employers with employees where you need to get something done. Like I know in, our, in, in marriage, you know, this is one of the things that I teach in marriage is this, that when a husband and wife are just like at each other about something and they just, they, something came up and it was like a landmine and you stepped on it and you go, who knew there was a landmine there? You know what I'm talking about, an emotional landmine? You've got stuff you need to get done. Like children need to be fed and jobs need to be done. People need to go to work. You're not going to solve that problem the same day. Make an appointment. I counsel this a lot of times. It's like, have your discussion till 10 p.m., and then if you got business to do, just get out your calendar and go, well, honey, when can we continue this argument? Well, how about tomorrow? No, I got that doctor's appointment tomorrow. Well, how about Wednesday? No, Johnny has to go to soccer Wednesday night. That's the tournament. Well, Thursday, uh, no, that's not going to work because Aunt Mabel is coming over. Okay, uh, so today's Monday, so Friday, Friday night. Okay, Friday night. There we go. 
we're going to have this appointment to continue this argument a week from now. Guess what will probably happen on Friday night? You forgot what you were arguing about. It's like, because, why? Because you're calm. You've settled down. You've maybe gone to the Lord about it. You've thought about it. You've talked about it. You know, what were we going to argue? I see we have an appointment to argue. What were we going to argue about again? Well, it wasn't really an argument. It was more of a discussion. It was about thus and so. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, my answer is this on that. Oh, okay, I thought so. What's for dinner? If your pastor kills your sacred cow, take a deep breath. Ask him about it. If you're calm, discuss it. If you're not calm, please don't be offended if he says, we need to continue this in about a couple of weeks or a month. Please don't be offended by that. And last, be very, very careful not to misquote the scriptures when you think you have a disagreement. Really get down to the exact wording of something. Here's a great thing. I'm giving really practical advice for church here. Um, in most churches, the message is recorded, and you can go back and listen to it. So if, if you think, well, pa the pastor said such and such. Well, did he really? Get the recording. Go back and listen to it and decide if the context and the words were exactly what you thought they were. And I think you'll find a lot of times they're not. Maybe sometimes they are. Maybe the pastor misspoke. The words of the prophets are subject to the spirit of the prophets. People make mistakes from up here. It's okay to call them on it. It's okay to talk about it. Second Peter says this, Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our brother, beloved brother Paul, according to, whom, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Peter is saying this. You know that Paul? <coughs> By the way, Peter and Paul, they were like this, right? Oil and vinegar. But they respected each other. They loved each other. They spoke highly of each other, even when they were in disagreement with each other about things. Peter's saying this. You know those writings of Paul? Sometimes they're really hard to understand, aren't they? They're really hard to understand. He speaks things, some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstoppable people then twist to their own destruction. So just because a teaching from a pastor or the scripture is difficult to understand, that, that makes it all the more important that we not twist the words of the teacher, that we be really careful to quote exactly, to quote precisely, and then to ask what that means. These unstable people twist to their, these words to their own destruction as they do also to the rest of scriptures. Here he's not speaking primarily about believers in the church, but he's speaking primarily of critics of the church, critics of Christ, CNN, for example, taking a scripture and twisting it. Well, you just believe an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You're full of vengeance. And we close with abstain, verse 22, Abstain from every form of evil. Evil. That's the calling of the believer, isn't it? We don't do the bad things. I was staying at a youth hostel in Greece many years ago, and painted on the side wall of this white building was this in very imperfect English. It said, the bad actions are forbidden. <laughs> okay, that was cute. Abstain from every form of evil, says the scripture. The bad actions are forbidden. We should be beyond that. As we test every spirit, as we, as we do not quench the spirit, as we do not despise prophecies, as we test all things and hold fast to what is good, we're also mindful of this. Our job is to live a holy life, a life pleasing to God and to abstain from every form of evil. 
Lord God, we thank you for this reading of your word, for this practical teaching today. We ask you, God, to give us the wisdom and the fortitude to test all things and to hold fast what is good and to not overreact when somebody kills our sacred cow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for your kind attention this morning. We're going to break for the women's ministry, and uh, it meets back there. Men, I'll, if you want to come, I'll see you over at Firehouse Subs. That's where Kellen and I and some others will be hanging out and eating sub sandwiches.